hello. I'm Carol Hilty, Superintendent of the Colorado School for the Deaf and the Blind, CSDB. Welcome. I'm happy that you have decided to watch this program. I hope that you enjoy it. We welcome your feedback. Fire, 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 warm, 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 we're going camping, it's snowing, I'm cold, I'm going to build a fire. Are you warm? Yes, the fire is warm. Fire. 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 Warm. 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 Thank you for joining us today. My name is Kristen Huddleston and I'll be presenting on behavior, basic strategies, and supports. My colleague Kathy Empter will join later. The overview of this presentation includes discussing basics, developing positive behaviors, challenges, those challenging behaviors, how do we address those, consequences, how and when, setting limits, some common struggles, and tactile tools that can help in working with children with vision loss. And starting with the basic, I'm sure many of you have seen a hierarchy of needs triangle similar to this one. As you know, the bottom of the triangle are our basic needs, and those needs become more complicated as you go up. When we think about behaviors in our children, oftentimes we will see escalated or negative behaviors when those basic needs are not met. For instance, sleep. They recommend that children ages 7 to 12 get 10 to 11 hours of sleep a night. Children t ages 12 to 18 get 8 to 9 hours of sleep per night. If it's been a busy time and your child has not gotten enough sleep, this may be the reason that you're seeing those negative behaviors. Another key basic is nutrition. We all know that it's very important to eat a variety of foods focusing on healthy foods rather than those easy and sometimes fast snacks and sugars. Routines and schedules. Obviously, especially for our younger kids, but even teenagers, the more that we maintain routines and schedules, the easier it is for students, as it is for ourselves. There are times when routines and schedules cannot be followed, and you will need to set up um, reminders and help your child with those times. Communication with children is key. Many times in our lives we get busy and just don't take the time to sit down and talk with them. Um, finding out what's going on with them, how they're doing, or if there are other things that they need that we just weren't aware of. Family time. Um, it sounds like something just for younger kids, but actually they find that having specific family time on a weekly basis, if not a daily basis, is very beneficial for children of all ages. When we look at behavior, the ideal start is to develop those positive behaviors, focusing on what we want to see from our children rather than focusing on the behaviors they exhibit that we don't prefer. At school, we set those up by first identifying those expectations. What is it we want to see in our students? For example, at school we focus on positive attitude, on respect, on independence. Those are some of the key words, behavior expectations that we like to see from our students. Once we have identified them, then we teach them what does it mean to respect? What does it look like? What do I hear from you when you're respecting? What do you hear from me when I'm respecting? Aligning with teaching is modeling that, showing them, 
letting them see and hear what those behavior expectations look like. Then we practice them, giving the kid, which can be five minutes sometimes, time to practice. What does respect look like when you're standing in line in the cafeteria, when you're sitting in class and you're bored with the topic? Practicing those behavior expectations. Next and most important is the acknowledgement, catching them being good. At school, we practice a five to one ratio, trying to catch those positives, notice them five times more than one to every one correction. So for example, a, a positive can be, hey, great job, I really liked how you showed your positive attitude during that. Or it can just be a smile, a pat on the back, shaking their hand, acknowledging that they're doing well and they're doing what we asked of them. Lastly, there are times when we have to review those expectations as needed. If there's a big concert at school, if we're having a special luncheon in the cafeteria, reviewing those expectations prior to those events helps students know what they need to do and show those positives. Transferring those to home is the exact same setup. You want to identify those expectations that you want at home. When you're teaching and modeling those, trying to think about the physical prompts or verbal prompts that your child might need and helping them remember what it is they need to do. Practicing again, acknowledging that five to one as much as you can and reviewing as needed. Despite setting up positive behaviors, you will encounter challenging behaviors. Um, and here are some tips for how to address those challenging. As we said, most important is focusing on those strengths and interests of your child. Obviously not during the challenging behavior, but setting up those times, whether it's a family time, a meal time, where you're chatting with your student about what they did well, what they're enjoying, those kinds of topics. They recommend um, greeting your child every morning and evening with positives instead of negatives. In fact, one recommendation is called the 30-minute rule. So when you arrive home after work and they arrive home after school, that first 30 minutes just be chat time, catching up on how everybody's day was, things they're looking forward to, things that went well in their day, rather than focusing on things they need to do, how they did on their tests, what kind of homework they have, did they finish their chores, those kinds of more negative focused activities. Um, great to see you is a recommended way to start that 30 minute rule um, because it focuses um, it's felt more out of love than out of fear. When we say great to see you, we're showing them that we're eager, that we're excited to, to find out how their day was um, and to celebrate their day versus focusing on their homework makes them feel it's more out of fear, fear that maybe they don't care about their homework or that we don't think they'll be responsible and take care of it. So it's a good positive way to interact with them at the end of the day rather than those list kind of how did you do, this is what you need to do kinds of things. Similarly, using empathy um, is a really important step in addressing behavior. Um, obviously, part of this is setting up that empathy prior to challenging behavior. Um, the statement, I've noticed that. I noticed that you like skateboarding. I've noticed that you're doing really well in your math these days. I've noticed that your haircut looks really nice these days. Picking behaviors that you've seen shows them that you're paying attention and that you want to be involved in their lives. It helps build that empathy with your child when things are good. Then when you have a situation where they've made a mistake, you can still use that empathy as a tool. For example, if a child breaks a window, you can start with, wow, that's a drag. I wonder how you're going to take care of paying for that, rather than the typical lecture and, oh my gosh, this is so expensive, and kind of response that often leads to resentment from the child and frustration for us as parents. Um, next is replacing those lectures and warnings with enforceable statements. Lectures and warnings are tiresome for us and are perceived most of the time by children as being preached at. Enforceable statements take all of that away. Examples, instead of saying, hurry up, you can say, this car leaves in five minutes. Instead of saying, clean your room so we can go shopping, you would say, I'll be happy to take you shopping 
when your room is clean. The consequences embedded in the statement, it still tells them what's expected or what they'll get when it's done, but it's not about me lecturing them anymore. Now it's about informing them what they need to do to move on. Another example for older students um, that I liked was, as long as you live in this house, you will never drink alcohol. You could replace that with an enforceable statement, such as, I'll be glad to let you drive my car when I never have to worry about you having alcohol. Same concept, but it comes across much more empowering to students rather than us just lecturing or preaching to them. Next are delayed consequences. Oftentimes as parents, when something happens and we're upset and a consequence needs to happen, we in the heat of the moment can go overboard or not respond as well as we would like to because it's the heat of the moment. Using delayed consequences is a huge tool. Um, it buys us time to come up with an appropriate consequence to make sure that we're using a logical consequence and it may prevent explosions in our children. An example would be, I will have to do something about that, but not now, later. Try not to worry about it. Obviously, we do want them to think about it some, maybe even come up with their own ideas for consequences that would match the behavior that they had, that misbehavior. Aligning with that is delayed gratification. An example of behavior that we often see for kids is just them wanting our attention. And typically when, they're, when we're in the middle of about five other things. An easy way to address that and teach that delayed gratification is, I will address your very important issue in 10 minutes when it's more appropriate for me and I can give you my full attention. It lets them know that you are listening, that you will address their issue, but not right this moment. Teaching delayed gratification is very import important for children. They found that for children that don't understand that concept of delayed gratification, they can become entitled. It can lead to that, a sense of entitlement. You can also think about it as the responsibility that we as parents have to give children what they need, not necessarily, every, necessarily everything they want. Um, you can't develop character if you do not master the art of delaying gratification. And character is one of the greatest things that we can teach our children. So teaching them to hold a minute and then giving them that attention is very important. Lastly, as a tool, is focusing on logical consequences instead of punishments. And this is something that the delayed consequence really helps us to do. Um, we all grew up with more of the punishment type of thing versus the logical consequence. The difference is that logical consequences are linked in a meaningful way to the misbehavior of the child versus a punishment that's just intended to make them suffer for doing something wrong. Taking that time to come up with a logical consequence will help us and them respond to that situation in a much better way. So moving into setting up those consequences versus punishments, five tips. Number one, addressing the reason for behavior. When you're identifying the behaviors that you want or the behaviors that you're struggling with, First, figure out why that behavior is happening. Are they using the behavior as a means to communicate? Are they using the behavior as a way to get your attention? And make sure that the consequence aligns with that reason for the behavior. For example, if a child is constantly interrupting you because they want your attention and you're working on teaching them that delayed gratification, when they interrupt you, you could simply take their hand, set them on the couch and ask them to wait maybe not even verbally responding in order to teach them, you're not gonna to respond to those interruptions. They will have to wait to get your attention. As we've already talked about delaying that consequence, buying yourself the time to think about it. Another thing to consider is asking for help. A lot of times in the heat of the moment or even when we're thinking about it, we have ideas of consequences, but we're not sure. Calling your spouse or a friend or a parent, a colleague, a friend asking for help in how you should address that situation is a very helpful idea um, and certainly something that we should do more often. Um, aligning with that is making a plan from, with help from others. If my child needs to buy a new window, needs to come up with that money, they may need chores to earn money. I might not have enough just around the house chores for them to earn money, but maybe my friend needs their lawn boat or maybe I have another 
friend who's moving and needs boxes packed or moved. Those kinds of ideas where friends can help and calling them and having that plan set up before I sit down with my student just helps up make it more smooth. A big piece in setting up consequences um, is to really start empowering children to come up with their own problems, their own solutions, I'm sorry, solutions to their own problems. Rather than us always coming up with the solutions, just start having them think about it. How? Like the example we gave, breaking the window, what a drag, I wonder how you're going to pay for that. Not me telling you, what are your ideas? Kids are amazing when you give them that chance. They can come up with some really creative ideas for how to solve it themselves. If, given time, they still aren't able to solve it, then we probably need to move into that situation where we're giving the consequence um, if they can't solve the problem. It's okay to give them suggestions as part of guiding them to their own solutions. It's certainly, as they're younger, you'll give more suggestions, and as they get older, they'll be able to kind of pick and choose from previous circumstances to know appropriate ones. Another really good idea um, when giving consequences, when thinking about behaviors, oftentimes we want students, kids, to do stuff for us that they really don't want to do, like cleaning their room, helping mow the lawn. They're really not interested at all in that. We need the help. Sometimes it's okay to phrase it that way with kids and just say, would you do this just for me? That way, they are more likely to do it because they understand that it's you asking it of them versus you telling them they have to do it for their own internal reward when they don't necessarily have that. All right, I think at this time, Kathy's going to come on and talk a little bit about setting limits. It's important to know that to kind of deal with some of these consequences and kind of um, avoid the punishment section part of, the, of discipline, you need to really ask yourself, how are you setting limits in your house? Setting limit is not the same as an ultimatum. Uh, limits aren't threats, and an ultimatum is um, a threat, basically. If you say, if you don't clean up your room, you're going to be grounded for the weekend, that, that's a threat. Limits offer choices. Um, more so if you said, if you clean your room, um, you can spend time with your friends. You're not threatening them. You're not telling them if you don't clean your room, you're gonna, they're going to deserve this punishment. You're giving them a choice. It is their choice to clean their room or not. But if they make that choice, they have some ownership of the consequences. If going out with their friends is what they really wanted to do and they make that choice not to clean their room, then that choice is on them. It's not coming from you as a punishment. You can also say, um, if you clean your room, you can hang out with your friends this weekend. If you don't clean your room, you won't be allowed to go out with friends. It's your decision. And I'm speaking more from an older student perspective. Kids have the ability to make those decisions. And by making those decisions, they're owning a lot of that power in that decision. And it's not a consequence or a punishment that's kind of doled out by you as a parent. Also, limits are to teach, not to punish. With limits, children begin to understand how their actions have consequences, both positive and negative. By giving children choices and consequences, we are providing them with a great structure for future decision making um, when, when they get older and, and they need to make other choices in their life. They have the practice of making good decisions. Um, t also, limits are about listening, not about talking. Taking the time to really listen and understand your child, you're finding out what's really important to them, what kinds of things that they're really um, thoughtful about, what they're feeling. And also by listening to your child, you learn more about what's important to them when they make their choices. You can kind of build some of those choices into your statements with them and, and kind of the limits that you're setting in your household. The next few slides we have are, um, it's, a, it's a basic self-assessment. I want you to kind of look at some of the questions and think about how you feel about how you set limits in your house. Everybody that's watching probably has a different idea of what a, an appropriate limit might be. So this self-assessment is more for you to kind of look at what you're doing and, and kind of your values about what setting limits are. So the first one is the main purpose of discipline is, is it A, to punish for bad behavior? Is it B, to teach my child how to make good decisions? Or is it C, to vent my frustration and anger? So think about how you set limits in your house and be honest with yourself. Um, I think that 
we think that we're setting limits for all the right reasons, but when we really look at each situation, we might need to step back and, and be honest with wh where these reactions are coming from. So think about um, your answer, and the correct answer really is B. We want to teach our children how to make good decisions. Just a, um, a, a bit of trivia, the Latin word for decision is, it means to teach or to lead. So if you kind of think about what discipline really means, it's not supposed to be a punishment, but we're really taking each situation and trying to teach our students and trying to lead them into making great decisions. The next question, why as parents do we often go back to punishment instead of setting limits and using logical consequences? Is it A, because the punishment is just easier? B, because when we're angry, frustrated, or hurt, it's our first reaction? C, because punishment works in the short term? Or D, all of the above? So maybe think back to a situation you've had with your child. Kind of think about a time when you doled out a punishment and think about how you were feeling in that moment and why did you choose that punishment? Which one of these? answers would you have have chosen and I think we all know that the answer is all of the above we've all reacted in ways um, in situations that have happened because it's just an emotional reaction it's quick it's not logical and it is kind of a shoot from the hip kind of reaction it's what it's it's what comes out without really taking that time as Kristen talked about earlier delaying that time so, and giving your child some time to think about what's happening giving yourself some time to think about what's happening and then also getting on the same page so you can make logical consequences instead of punishment The last one is, I just want you to think about what it means in your family to set a limit with a child. And like I said, every family is different. Every family has different values, different value systems. So what does it mean specific for you personally to set a limit with your child? And all of your answers may be different. I like to think that setting a limit means providing a child with both choices and consequences of those choices. So giving a child a choice, letting them think about their choice, and then also letting them live with the, cho with the choice that they made. It's important when you give child, a child choices like that, that you give them time to think about the choices. I think oftentimes we, we're in a hurry, we really want the kids to choose, clean your room or don't go out with friends, or mow the lawn or do the laundry, things like that, but they really need some time to think about it. They may need some help. Maybe they don't know how to do the laundry to the way that you would like them to do it. So you might need to take some time. Give them a choice. Walk away. Come back in five minutes. You can even tell them, here's your choices, laundry or lawn. I'll give you five minutes to think about it. When I come back, let me know what you'd like to do. It's you're really empowering them to make a lot of good choices by giving them that time to think about it and then letting them choose the consequences that they can live with. So the differences between setting limits and punishment, um, punishment comes from our emotion, not necessarily the child's behavior. If you think about the last time your child ran out in the street, maybe the impulsively they ran across the street for a toy, our emotion is immediate fear. Our emotion is not, a, it's, it's a very logical emotion, but however the punishment doesn't necessarily come from the child's behavior, it's coming from our emotion of being fearful that something was going to happen. So when we feel angry, hurt, or frightened by something that our child has done, oftentimes we allow our emotion, not our logic, to dictate what kind of punishment that child is going to have. It's also easier to think of punishment rather than logic. Logic takes a, uh, takes a lot of time. It, it requires us to be calm. It requires us to look at the situation from the child's perspective and also think about what's important to that child. Punishment is a quick and easy solution although it's not always um, effective. Punishment, um, the next two points kind of go together. Punishment works in the short term and limits work in the long term. Um, punishment, like I said, is a quick fix for what's happening right now. But if you're setting limits with your child, it's something that they're going to carry with them, not just right now, but they can carry it into their school day. They, can, they know how to develop limits within themselves in the long term. Punishment fosters a lot of resentment, especially from my experience with students that are in their teenage years. Limits foster more independence as opposed to that resentment. 
Speaking from the perspective of students who are blind or visually impaired, limits are important. It's important that we keep in mind that if your student is blind or visually impaired, they can have limits, and you need to have high expectations for those limits. Just because a student is blind or visually impaired, sometimes it's easy for us to want to do for them. It's quicker. Um, it's, it saves on frustration for them and for us. However, it's not really encouraging them to be independent. So coming up with some of those limits that we would expect if they have siblings, making those limits as similar to their siblings' limits as possible is a good way to get those um, students who are blind or visually impaired to have some independence, to feel more empowered, and to also feel more equal as a more equal member of your family as well. So we've had, um, we've talked about a lot of different ways to deal with, with punishment, with consequences, with limits, and now we kind of have a list of common struggles that we hear often from parents who ask us for help about how to deal with these kinds of things. The first one is bedtime. Obviously, bedtime is a really hard time for younger students. Sometimes the bedtime gets pushed back an hour or two hours, and now they're, they're tired, going back to what Kristen was talking about, those basic needs. Sometimes they're too tired to even be logical for themselves. It's not recommended that you go back to a regular bedtime immediately with those younger kids. If they're an hour outside of their bedtime, the next day try to just go 15 minutes earlier. Then the next day try to go 15 more minutes. Of course, a natural consequence for older students at bedtime is that they're going to be tired. They need to get up in the morning, they need to come to school, they need to do their homework. They have all of these expectations for them that they can't complete if they're just tired. The next one is homework. Again, keeping in mind the trick that Kristen was talking about, the 30-minute rule, when your child walks in the door and you immediately, the first thing you say to them is, do you have homework? It kind of puts them on a defensive. Um, you you want to kind of respect that 30-minute check-in time, chat time, just kind of a hi, how are you kind of time. Some things that you can tell your student if your student likes to procrastinate their homework is you can say, hey, I'm available from 7 to 8 to help with homework. And it, what you're doing is you're encouraging them to really spend that, that hour working on their homework, but it's also giving them a choice. If they need help after that hour, that's their choice, that they, have, they did not adhere to the, the limits that you set with them. You can also set up limits that the TV is available for anybody who has their homework finished. That, again, is their choice. If they choose not to do their homework, then they can't expect to have the, the privilege of watching TV. Another common struggle that we hear about is chores. Students don't like to do chores. chores. Um, again, speaking for your student that's blind or visually impaired, they, sh they should have chores. Whatever chore is um, a good match for them, you need to be encouraging them to be contributing to the household hold with chores. That may mean that you need to help them. It may mean that you need to physically teach them how to do it. But every child, regardless of um, a vision disability or not should have something to contribute to the household and some kind of responsibility. Older students, you can give them a choice. Like I said, would you prefer to mow the lawn or do the laundry? There's no out in there. You're still going to have something done for you. Um, uh, you're still going to have responsibility for them, but they, they're kind of owning some of that choice. Younger students, if you're noticing that they're, they're struggling with their chores, they're not motivated, they don't want to do it, you can set up a positive behavior acknowledgement for students that do their chores. All, all of my kids who are finished with their chores are welcome to join me for ice cream. The students that haven't finished their chores, of course, miss out on the ice cream, but again, that's their choice. The next time, they're more likely to do what it is that you've asked them to do. Another common struggle is nutrition. I think we've all probably have had an, op a, an experience with a, with a child that sits at the dinner table for two hours after dinner because they won't eat their peas. Really, that is not <laughs> really fostering a good choice for them in the future. There's no reason for them to do better the next time. Setting up a limit in your kitchen, at your, di at your dining room table, something to the effect of, I serve dinner until 7.30, get what you need now to be ready for breakfast or until breakfast. Students who are blind or visually impaired might not have that idea of time, and that's really um, applicable for any of these that where you're using a time, a specific time. You may need to set a timer for them. You may need to have a tactile reminder for them of what, how, how time is winding down. If at 7.30 everybody's done in the kitchen, the kitchen is closed, whether they have finished their meal or not, 
you may need to set a timer for them and give them some warnings. There's 15 minutes left, there's 10 minutes left. All of our students do better with transitions. And hopefully that will help a little bit with um, getting the kids to eat their dinner and then moving on afterwards. An older struggle that we get with, with kids that are a little bit older in age is friends and dating. Um, I've told parents that they can always say, you're welcome to go out with any friends whom I have had the pleasure of meeting. So you kind of get an idea of who your kids are going out with, you've met them, you can decide whether that person is a good match for your student or not. Sometimes this brings on arguments, but again, we can pull from what Kristen was talking about earlier. I'll be glad to discuss this with you as soon as the arguing has stopped. Kind of giving them some of that delayed gratification. I'm really mad right now. I encourage you to calm down. When you and I, our voices sound the same, then we can discuss this further. Outings is another common struggle. Sometimes taking your child to the grocery store is a struggle. They want to buy this, they want to touch that, they want to pull this down, whatever. Um, setting up those limits like we talked about before you go on your outing can save you a lot of time in the long run. Maybe telling your child, those who can follow the rules are welcome to join me to the grocery store. And then make sure you teach what those rules are. And then when they're at the grocery store and they're following those rules, again, we want to acknowledge that you notice that they're following their rules. Uh, younger children, again, um, are going to need some transition warnings. You know, um, if you have um, an outing at the end of the day that's not common, it's kind of out of the ordinary, when the child gets home from school, you might want to let them know. Um, blind and visually impaired students really rely a lot on routine and schedule. And if there's a change in their routine, you need to really let them know ahead of time and then maybe give them some warnings along the way. The last common struggle that I added was about screen time, texting, computers, um, any, any kind of anything in front of a screen. Again, I'd be happy to let you have screen time as soon as your chores are finished, as soon as your homework is finished, as soon as dinner is finished. Any of those things that you can do where you're giving the child a choice, then they're kind of owning. If they lose their computer time that day, it's, it's their choice. They decided to have that consequence. The last couple of slides I have are specifically with things that you can do in your house to um, help with some behavior issues that might come up with your student who is blind or visually impaired. You can set limits, you can have logical consequences, you can do everything that we've asked or taught you about, but there still may be some struggles. And what we like to do here at school is we use a lot of tactile reinforcement with students who are blind or visually impaired. Um, the first one is, these are just foam cutouts and they have pieces of large sequence um, that a student can earn. When a student earns um, something for, let's say, the behavior uh, expectation is homework, they've done their homework, they get one of those pieces of sequence glued onto a foam disc. It's something they can feel, it's something they can count, especially for younger students. You can talk with them ahead of time. How many do you think you can get? And kind of set it up, make it exciting for them. When they get as many as they needed to get or that was decided upon, you can trade those in for something. Maybe we're going to go to the playground. Maybe we're going to go um, to the mall. Whatever is meaningful for that student. Those are just easy, simple, inexpensive things that um, you can put them on the refrigerator or in the child's room or wherever that they can reference back to it. The next one is another um, kind of positive reinforcement. You see that the little um, paw prints there, we are the CSDB Bulldogs, so we tend to use paw prints a lot here. Um, they are drawn on with puppy paint, so when you feel them, you can kind of feel the shape of the paw. The students earn those for their behavior expectations, for having a positive attitude, for showing respect, for independence. If those are words that you're using in your home as well, you can set those up as behavior expectations, and when the child shows you or demonstrates those things, they can earn those paw prints. When they get five paw prints, one for each behavior expectation, they can again trade that in for some kind of reward or recognition that they would like to have. We are using positive attitude, respect, independence, things like that here at school, but you can make this individualized to your home. If, you, if you're using um, independence in your home, what does that mean? Does that mean when they come in the house, they get started right away on their chores? Does that mean that independence in their bedroom means that their bedroom is always clean? Things like that, but you need to take the time to teach it to them and let them know what it means. 
The next one is just a couple more examples also of some more tax tower enforcements. The first one, um, that's a schedule. Um, each one of those, there's, there's a yellow uh, rectangle and a red one, a green one. Each one of those has a symbol glued on it, and each symbol means a specific activity. For example, the yellow rectangle has a little um, chain. It's like a necklace chain glued onto it. So a child that is um, blind or vision impaired feels that, and they know that that is representative of the playground. The next one is um, half of a rubber ball cut in half, and that's glued on there, and they know that that means gym. It's a very tactile, structured schedule for the students, so there's no surprises in their day. When you can kind of um, eliminate surprises, it helps keep behavior in check as well, because they know what to expect. If there is a surprise, put it on the board so they can, you can talk about it. You can say, hey, after, after we get up and have breakfast, we're going to go to grandma's house. That's not something you do every day, but it's something that they can expect. Another tactile reinforcement um, for a student who is blind or visually impaired is called a task. A, a task book. This one is specific for school. Um, basically what it means is if the student works first, then she gets a break. And a break for her is a snack item. You could easily modify this at home. You could change work into um, laundry. Um, for This is more for a younger student. Um, let's say a student who struggles with you every time she has to brush her teeth when she goes to bed. Maybe it brushes her teeth then the fun item, the break item, is maybe a story with mom. Something like that. You just want to give them the idea of, if I do this, then I have this. But if I don't do this, there's a consequence. I, I don't get this thing that I wanted. And I think there's one more, the last one. These are just as simple as pennies in a jar. Um, some students like to, they can earn um, pennies towards something that they would like to buy, but again, you have to set up that limit, set up that expectation of what are they earning pennies for. Um, pennies in a jar are so simple for students who are very young. They get to count the pennies. Um, they can use the pennies uh, to purchase things. If they have um, not followed a rule, if they have broken something, if they have um, struggled with you on something, maybe they need to buy that time back from you, you spent 10 minutes struggling with them, so maybe they owe you 10 pennies, things like that. They're getting this idea of, of behaviors and consequences, and the choices they make have consequences. So in closing, kind of to wrap up everything um, that Kristen and I have covered, you do want to confirm that their basic needs are being met. Again, those are so important. All of us have basic needs, and if we're not having our basic needs met, then we certainly can't interact with our children. I, I love it on airplanes when they say, put on your own oxygen mask first before you put it on your child. If you are not feeling like your basic needs are being met, then you are not there to help them. So make sure that you're taking care of yourself as well. Encourage positive behaviors. Again, acknowledging, we talked about that five to one ratio. The five positives acknowledge what your student is doing well and that's going to increase the likelihood that that child is going to do those same behaviors again. Uh, we gave you some, some things to kind of put in your tool bag, kind of resolving some of those challenging behaviors. What do you do when those challenging behaviors come up? We've give, given you some very specific statements that you, can, um, that you can use in some of those challenging situations. Always looking at giving the child a choice with clear, logical consequences, and then allowing the child to choose which consequence they can live with. Again, consequences, it's their choice. A punishment comes from us. Um, a, a logical consequence is something that they would be able to, to do and, and to learn from so that they're less likely to have that behavior again. Setting limits versus punishing. Using those limits um, as opposed to um, punishment, those, setting those limits are very logical. They're not emotion, coming from our emotion, and they're very long-term, as opposed to using those punishments that are emotionally driven and are kind of a quick fix in the moment. And then lastly, tactile aids. Some of your students may need some additional support when it comes to this. Um, providing visuals for students that are visually impaired, some tactile aids, some physical reminders, things like that 
we can't assume that the student knows exactly what we're talking about just verbally. We might need to kind of figure out different ways to be creative and kind of match the student where they are so that they can kind of internalize some of that behavior and it's more likely to stick and that, that you'll see that, that behavior carried out in the long run. So we thank you for joining us today. Hopefully we've provided you some ideas of some ways to deal with some challenging behaviors and we wish you luck. Thanks. Fire. 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 Warm. Warm, warm. We're going camping. It's snowing. I'm cold. I'm going to build a fire. Are you warm? Yes, the fire is warm. Fire. Fire, fire, warm, warm, warm.